So for those of you who are not at CHI, my name is Gary Morrison. I work at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And in the computer science department there, doing HCI type stuff. I've been there for eight years. So if you're interested, the accent is Irish, not South African. He's <laughs> genuinely South African. And most of my work revolves around mobiles, because there are mobiles everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And they crop up in different forms. In, in towns, do you know about these containers that people have? Uh, so what happens is, you know old containers off lorries and stuff? Uh, they kit them out with cell phones that are shared usage. So that's what it looks like inside. And so these are different because these are cell phones that are used by any arbitrary person as opposed to you know, your own person. So different people have different experiences of the cellular network. And what's with that landline Oh, that is actually the cellular handset. They, they multiplex into the cellular network. So, so although it looks like a landline, it is actually. And if you go in on these booths, ugh, um, there are numbers written up and, and important stuff. So it says, so it's a weird ecology. And these have been so popular because you cannot steal handsets out of a solid metal container. Um, usually, um, that the cell phone companies themselves, so this is one of the networks, Cell C, are making these containers now. It started out as kind of a, an ad hoc MacGyver kind of solution, but now it, it's got real traction and, and these guys rush into townships, bloop, there you go, there's your communication and they run back out again. But what's interesting to me as a pretend ethnographer, so I should say I'm a computer scientist originally, but I've kind of seen the light since then, is um, I know, that's fine, my career's over anyway. Um, is what grows up in the townships, these uh, cell centers become like a focal point and you get all these funny little businesses starting up. So this is Indiaka Cell Repairs with very interesting spelling of words and so forth. You can see there. Uh, and then there, there are people selling fruit, and this becomes like a, a central point for, for the neighborhood. And, and this, uh, I took these sh shots. Uh oh, is that bad? Somebody must accept it, though, because it's a second. So I took these shots at the start of my sabbatical, which was in the second half of last year. And so these are taken in around the. Yes. yes. Oh. Okay. They're not showing. Yes. Sorry. We'll. Wait. Is that another site in New York? Press presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we dialed in the wrong room. In there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do anything. Can, Can you see, see now, Antonella? Okay. Yeah. Continue, and I'll. I'll let's okay. Something. Will you fiddle? Mm -hmm. So give us a high sign, Antonella, when you can see it. Okay, so uh, these are rural, sorry, urban usage. And then I went, spent a couple of months going through Zambia and Malawi. So Zambia and Malawi are two of the 10 poorest nations on earth. <coughs> but I was hearing all sorts of stories about cell phone usage. So I don't know if you can see, uh, these are actually zebra, zebra down here in the grass. Everywhere you go, there are cell phones. Um, to recap quickly, 77% of South Africans have cell phones, yet only 11% of South Africans earn enough income to be liable for income tax. Right? So, so that, that's kind of startling. So they have cell phones or they keep them active at all times? That's active usage. Okay. I met a lot of people who do have cell phones, but they don't always have enough credit. On I'll to make talk about that in a minute. Okay. So, so they're not on monthly plans? No, no, no one's on monthly plans. Oh, okay. They're all paying as we're going. And the other comment I'll add here is it, it, the, the stories you're telling are very consistent in lots of the third world that I've been in, too. I've been in, for example, parts of the Caribbean, exactly similar. You see an unemployed guy with two cell phones on his belt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So there, there is this, all, this shared usage as well. There are these telephone bureaus. This is Malawi, um, where they just take over an old shack and put in the cell phones and get a battery. This particular village has no electricity. So the guy puts the car battery on the back of his bicycle wheels off, gets a charge, comes back, people bring in their cell phones. Uh, 
Yeah. Wow. It's kind of kind of a weird thing. Um, and, and this company, Celtel, besides the the containers being dropped in, they can't afford to do that in Zambia. Uh, they they build these little shacks uh, where you can go and buy airtime, or it's kind of a, a less organized affair. So I know I can understand how you go here and you can call somewhere, but if the other person is in the same economic status as you are, how do you know how to call them? Is it their yeah. to one of these things? Oh, yes, the, that's right. Okay, <laughs> I take your point. There, there is that, but so what most people, as Olga said, have their cell phone for is receiving calls. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, which, which sounds like uh, an oxymoron, but it's not really. No, okay. we just we have a different economic model. And I'm Precisely. Sorry. So everyone has a phone. In fact, in South Africa, there have been 80 million phones sold, and there are 40 million people living there. So there have been two phones sold for every member of population, which is why the 77% statistic is important that those 77% are active. They're making receiving calls. Um, what's happening? Well, Robin, a lot of people have them for work. This is a, a farm building way out in the middle of nowhere. So the farmer can phone up his workers and check that they're working. And so a lot of people get given phones for work. And then if they can save up a little money, they'll use them for their own private reasons. Also, for a lot of people, the only thing, the only piece of technology they can afford is a handset, which means that it get used for everything. This is a, a nice lady filling up my bike. There are two of us um, riding bikes at this point, and she used her calculator to add up, uh, to tally up what we owed. You go to the bank, everyone has their cell phone on a lanyard is doing the sums. They can't afford a calculator and the cell phone. That's just unheard of, wanton abandon. So is a cell phone cheaper than a calculator? No, it's not. But you can only afford one thing. OK. And a cell phone is cooler? The cell phone is much more useful. Because if you buy one of these, for example, it's got a torch built in as well. So you don't need to buy a torch either. And besides all the communication, the communication is very important. If those of you who were at Kai in my talk, I talked about kind of itinerant working. And families are, are torn apart because the husband's on the mine, and then his wife can SMS. So they're, they're very important social tools. Um, when I was in Zambia, I saw someone get a phone call on their cell, blah, 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 hang up, take their phone apart, put in a new SIM card, reassemble it make a call, blah, 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 take it apart again, put the original SIM card back in. And I got into this and I discovered there are three networks with slightly different tariff structures. Now, you and I, for the sake of a couple of cents, are not going to stand there and wait five minutes for our phone to reboot. But for these guys, that was a crucial difference. And to the point that you know, some people who run businesses, they've actually got three phones because they can't be bothered juggling. But it's cheaper to have three phones and, and you know, work out which tariff is going to be. And all this is denominated in US dollars. None of these cell phone companies are interested in learning, earning local currency. So they'll be, er be earning in dollars. So it is quite a price sensitivity. And as I said, if a cell phone's all you've got, um, then how you use it is very different. So how many of you got camera phones? Okay, most of you. What if that was the only camera you had in your life? There's no downloading. There is no backing up. Your whole life, you put your wedding photos on your camera, on your camera phone. That's the only place they're going to be kept. Right, so if you do that, it fundamentally changes the way you feel about your camera phone. And so guys that you talk to, Andrew um, was talking about this um, earlier today. When you go and meet someone, they come and they have a collection of photographs already on their phone. It's like a PowerPoint presentation of their life. And when you're chatting to them, they get it out and they, they take you through. It's quite a deliberate act. And because of the limited storage, they think very carefully about which images they keep and which they discard. And so I'll, I'll show you in a minute or two some of the projects we've done around that. So those are the kind of upbeat stories, a couple of not so good stories. 
Um, this is the Kakombu Business Center, and it's the border between Angola and Zambia. And it's run by this guy called Roy. And Roy is having trouble because the cell phone companies opened up two months ago. And he runs an internet cafe. And his internet cafe has had no customers in two months. And it is not that the people are accessing the internet through their phone, which they are to some extent. It's the fact that all the spare cash in this economy is now going on airtime. So the grocer shop is shutting down. The clothes shop is shutting down. Now, obviously, this is a novel effect, right? Obviously, people can't go on without shoes. Well, actually, they can and clothes. But it'll be interesting to see at what point, if ever, the businesses, the other businesses pick up. And it, this is in a tropical area, so you can grow pretty much anything you want to eat. So you don't need to shop for food. And so these cell phone companies are hoovering up. And so cell phones are killing the internet. Um, the other story that I hear a lot about cell phone usage in Africa is how it is helping subsistence farmers. Have you, any of you guys come across this story about how like the fishermen, they're out, they catch the fish and they phone up the markets. And then they go to the market that will give, and everyone feels nice and warm inside. Oh, I'm glad to be part of technology. Wow, I spoke to some of these guys on Lake Malawi and they just laughed. They go, what? Call the market. Says, look, these fish aren't worth the value of a phone call. And, and besides, why would I go to that market? All my friends are at this market. I don't want to go to that market for a couple of cents. Pointless. I'll go and see my friends. I'll have a good time, have a few beers. And so you think, yeah, you're right, actually. You know, if you're a subsistence farmer, what? So I, I poked around a little, and it, it turns out yeah, there are such systems for farmers, but it's for commercial farmers. If you have, you know, umpteen acres of coffee beans, you can subscribe to the National Farmers Union and find out which country you should export your beans to. But that's not really the stories that I was told about poor little subsistence one-man farmers. So I think there's a lot of disentangling of what's actually happening and what the companies would like you to believe is happening up there. The other thing is... Um, buying phones in the developing world. Do you, have any of you seen this handset before? This is the new Motorola handset designed for the developing world. And it's fantastic. It's really good. It uses e-ink for the screen. It uses little parts. It's got two antenna in it. So you don't have to be close to a base station. But I tell you now, no one is going to buy it. Right? Why would you buy a handset aimed at poor people? So if the only thing you can buy in your life is this one piece of technology, you're not going to aspire to the, you know, the, the crippled handset for poor people. I mean, these guys are just the same as us. There's no difference. Uh, the same thing happened with Siemens in, in Europe a few years ago when they launched a phone for old people. Right? They had big buttons on the screen. This is what old people want, right? So they don't have to put their glasses on to read the screen. But nobody bought it. Because would you... Go into, Yes, that's the phone for me. Crusty old person phone. Give me a phone. Oh, free cardigan. Fantastic. <laughs> so, so they, re, they remarketed it actually as the big button phone and they sold lots of handsets. But it's the same mentality. You know? And so if you go to a cell phone shop in Africa, what you buy are not cell phones, but batteries. Think about it. All your old handsets are getting stolen or traded in or whatever, but they end up in Africa. And the first thing you're going to need is a new battery because the batteries are dead. So you're going to a cell phone shop and there are no, no actual handsets for sale. So this is a, a, a battery for a Siemens. It comes with a 14 months guarantee, which is misspelt, but not to worry. Guarantee. guarantee. Now, if you imagine when you go in these shops, there are thousands of batteries, right? So how do you choose? Well, obviously, one with a 12-month guarantee is not as good as one with a 14-month guarantee. Even though there's no address or if this thing blows up and takes your head off, there's no one to sue. There's no address. You're stuffed. Uh, look at the packaging. There's a little tinfoil hexagon stuck on here to emulate uh, a hologram. 
right? It's kind of cargo cult. But my favorite bit is the free plastic cigarette. <laughs> right? The other major brand gives away uh, free pens, but pens are not cool. Look at this guy. You can see around his neck here. He is wearing his plastic cigarette with pride. So for some reason, I mean, it took me a long while to figure out what was going on. But it just so happens that in Zambia at the moment, it is really cool to have a plastic cigarette. And so people were buying these batteries. The other thing to notice is here is a hands-free kit made by the Bluetooth company. Now, it is not Bluetooth. There are big cables in here. And it is for your, for your Noki. NOKI 3100 7210 etc which is a good mitt for a mobile phone right? So is it locally manufactured? It's, it, no it's manufactured in China and these are the local importers have made this box okay. for it but if you said mate M-A-T-E oh, with a Zambian accent <laughs> it would sound like mitt <laughs> good mitt and then finally, of course, if you can afford the battery and you have a little spare cash, you would want a new... Oh, oh, sorry. Back up. The end. The end. Well done. Um, <laughs> look at the packaging here for the cases, right? You want a new case because your phone's scuffed. It's all white people because, again, it's an aspirational thing. I mean, I'm sorry, but this is just how it is in Africa. White people can afford good products. Therefore, if there's a picture of a white person using that product, it is good. I mean, let's not get into the sociology and the reasons for that. It's terrible. But that's how stuff's marketed. But if you look, th these are, look like scenes from films. But they're no films that I've ever seen. Uh, I carefully look through all of them. They're not actually taken for films because that someone might get sued then. So it's constructed to look like people in movies use these crappy covers for their cell phones. Fascinating. I, look, I don't know what the answer to this is. I'm still kind of rolling it around in my head. But there are all sorts of kind of <laughs> intricate understandings of, of the way stuff works there that just doesn't happen here, for example. And so... That's where I was at at the end of my sabbatical. These are just some insights for you to mull over. Another thing I thought I'd show you is just some of the projects that we work on to give you a feel for the kind of research that's being done there. One of these is in conjunction with a charity called Cell Life, which sends out uh, HIV workers to, to people who are HIV positive to assess uh, their needs of uh, drugs and so on. And I had a student who was working with this charity. He would go to a clinic and he would help the doctors build these applications for the clinic's nurses to put on their phone so they could go out, ask questions of the person, you know, um, ask about lesions and weight and stuff. And they hit sand and then the doctor could post the correct drugs uh, to the patient. It was a very efficient system. But my student realized actually he d there isn't enough time in the universe for him to go and visit all these clinics. So he built this system that allows you to collect, allows nurses and doctors to collect the data they want. They basically draw little screens and they hit deploy and it compiles into a technology called WIG. I don't know if you know this stuff. That gets installed on your SIM card. It's a SIM application. So it doesn't even need Java. This is a standard. It's a, the application cannot be bigger than something like 4K. It's crazy. But if you can fit what you need in 4K, it'll sit on the same card and acts through the menu system of the phone. I, d I don't know, in the, in the US, when you get a, a SIM card with your service provider, often on your handset there appears a menu from that service provider. Have you seen that? This is the same technology. It says on the SIM. And so Munir, he's, he's built this thing, and it's been given out to clinics. The other thing we built is for photo sharing. Remember I said about keeping all your photos in a handset? We'll have a nice project that shows you how you find the photographs, but we saw guys, you know, do, do you want to see my family? And they pass around their handset. So what you're seeing here on the screen are three separate screens. We did it on PDA, so you can see it. Um, but the idea is, if I want to show you my photos, these are being broadcast over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to the other handsets. So as I'm describing what's happening, um, other people can see, and as I pan around and touch things on the screen, or uh, with the five-way controller, 
that change is being instantly reflected in other people's phones. Now with the PDA version, uh, the student who did this, Leo, added a little drawing feature. And he thought it would be fun to not impose any protocol. In other words, there's no token passing. Anyone can contribute at any time. And what we discovered is people started drawing mustaches on each other and playing. And, uh, and the evaluations, we did it with friends because we thought it'd be useful for, for storytelling uh, amongst friends. And sure enough, these guys loved it to the point that, you know, when the evaluation's over, thank you very much. No, we're not going anywhere. We want these. Can we <laughs> give us back the... And so that, that was fascinating. And why, kind of the reason I'm telling you this is I would never have thought of this if I lived here in the developed world because I, sh I would share my photos over Flickr, put them on the internet, everybody can see them. Or I put them on my laptop and spin my laptop around. But if you have no laptop and you have no Flickr, how are you going to share photos? And so that made us think of a design solution that's not obvious, but yet has relevance and traction here, I think, as well, if you could do this. I, I've noticed this m myself. If I go out with my friends and we take photos of something, we, we will sit around afterwards and show each other the photographs of the thing that we have just done together. Do you do that? Oh, yeah. OK, so that's insane, right, on one level. Yes, I know, I was there. But somehow, <laughs> there is a kind of bonding around that. And, and so it's fun to do that. Um, and the project that Andrew is working on at the moment is building on this notion of people having, as Dan was saying, having cell phones but no airtime, can't afford to use them. And we discovered that people have an interest in information in their local area, in their village. And uh, what Andrew did was, was build a system whereby you have a big plasma screen. You got a phone? Thanks. And if I was interested in something, I would walk up to the screen and take a photo of what I wanted. Now, why would you do that? Well, all, this, all the stuff that we've seen to date on this, uh, where you have a, a small phone interacting with a situated screen, requires client software on the phone, right? To either recognize visual tagging or to, you know, to some link into the internet. But we set ourselves the design goal of, well, can you do it with no client software? Because the people we're trying to get to are not going to have you. It's not like they can download it off the internet. It's not going to work. So uh, what we eventually came up with is a system whereby you walk up to the screen and take a photograph. Now, at that point, the, the phone usually says, do you want to save this photograph or send it? You hit send via Bluetooth, and you send it to the screen. Now, the good news is, if you, if you have two devices that want to communicate with Bluetooth, normally you have to pair them, right, and type in the code. Have you done this? Mm -hmm. Right? And so, but that's not going to work with six people. You, OK, that's craziness. The other standard solution is to spam content at people. Do, does this happen in the USA yet? In London, if you walk down Oxford Street, every so often your phone goes boop, 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 and you go, accept incoming Bluetooth message, and it's some crappy advert, right? That irritates people. But if you send a photograph to a display, two things happen. Firstly, the photograph is tagged with the unique ID of your handset. So the system behind the screen now knows who sent the thing, what device sent the thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing you do is you run image recognition on the image that's just been sent. And there, you can see, ah, he wants information about what's happening at the school. And you can push back um, V cards or videos or documents. And the person now has it on their handset for free. No network connection involved. No special client software. As long as you know how to take a photo with your camera phone, you're in good shape. So it pushes it back to your device. It pushes back to one device. The other great thing is if you take a photo of something that is not on the screen, you can contribute content. So you send it up something, the system goes, this isn't something I know about, OK? So it just creates another little stack on the screen. So let's say you're a plumber, you have no job, you up your V card onto the screen, next person comes, ah, plumber, grab that, got the V card in the phone, hello, etc. So there is this huge interest in, in local content. And the, the, sorry, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
In these projects, we involve an NGO called Bridges.org, who help us understand the kind of social impact that we're having with these interventions. And they've got a list here called the Real Access Criteria. And I could talk about those, but I won't because it'll take all day. But one of them is, for any successful project, it must have local content. And so, because I was coming here today to Google, I was thinking, well, I think what we need in Africa is Google Village. Right, go with me here, people. <laughs> so this, this system that I've just described to you, it could be financially viable, right? So imagine you've got this big screen. You section off a portion of the screen uh, to a commercial or the government or some organization who has a vested interest, who is willing to put money into getting information to a place, even one of the cell phone companies, to buy airtime off the screen, let's say. So they pay for the screen and the PC. You hook it into the network over a little GPRS card, and then the village can upload and download and create its own local store of information for that village. Now, I don't know how to do searching and retrieving. And, okay, So I know some people who do in this room. Um, so I, I just thought, you know, if, if you guys, uh, Matt, you said you're interested in kind of getting into these sort of develop, did you? Maybe you didn't. Maybe I misheard yeah, you. Yeah. So these kind of developing world type things. I mean, this is, this is one thing I think that Google could do very well if ultimately as a company you guys wanted to get into, into Africa and do stuff. The main name's already been taken. Google Village. I, I thought this up two nights ago. I thought it was a good thing. <laughs> it's been done. It's been done. Great. My career is over. Um, anyway, so that's just something to think about. Um, how long have I got? No time. I'd, I'd say five to ten minutes. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll use five more. So just so, some other um, projects that we work on, which is uh, we're trying to do internet banking. I had this epiphany moment that I was telling people about at lunchtime where I, um, I saw someone come up to a street uh, trader and say, can I buy this thing here? And the trader said, yeah, sure, it's $5. And the other guy said, can I pay you an airtime? And the guy said, yeah, sure. And so in Africa, one of the networks, MTN, is this me-to-you system where you can peer-to-peer -peer transfer money as airtime. And so the guy went beep, 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 beep. And the trader went bing. Oh, yes, there you go. And so they move airtime around. Now think about this. People have been trying to do M banking solutions forever, and they start with banks. These guys don't have banks. They, they don't trust banks. They don't want to know about banks, because banks means tax. That's not good. But it, they trust the networks, nice, friendly MTN and Vodacom and these people. And, and there's no new interface. They know how to load airtime. They're just moving around airtime. And so. Unit you can send. 50 cents, 50 US cents. Yeah. That's how much an, an SMS costs. Yeah. It's an interesting micro. Yeah. Scale the scheme. So, I mean, you may think this is crazy, but people save up to buy 50 cents. They skip a meal, save 50 cents, and they can send an SMS to their husband. So, I just had this oh, airtime is the new currency. But unfortunately, I'm not an economist. And so, this is an idea that I'm trying to understand. Uh, I think if you want to launder money, it's a great idea. <laughs> 50 cents at a time. 50 cents at a time. <laughs> okay, last uh, two slides. One, uh, education. I have this crazy idea about getting rid of computers in developing world universities. Because all the students have cell phones already, and computers are such big, complicated, expensive things, I thought, well, if you've got a, if, even if you lease high-end cell phones to the students, where they could keep all their notes. We, we built a little system, which is what this thing's showing you, uh, where if you've got a laptop with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you hoover up a slide deck. It pushes it out to each of the clients in the room. So you've got all the notes here. If you need to work on the notes or write an essay, you take your cell phone along to the computer labs. There are no computers, but there's a docking station, a monitor, a keyboard, do all your stuff. Because the other big problem we have is the connectivity. Our entire university of 17,000 students and 5,000 faculty has a 10 megabyte link. 
right? That's 22,000 of us trying to use 10 meg. So we want the students to stop, you know, looking at pornography or whatever else is clogging up. So if you had to do all your searching through your cell phone, you would only really search for stuff that you actually needed, I conjecture. So that, I think it would solve a couple of problems at once, but my vice chancellor, he just smiles. <laughs> nice idea, Gary. So, but someday I, I hope to find someone who will sponsor that. And then um, last project, that again, um, Olga, interestingly enough, when she was in Cape Town, worked with a thing called the District 6 Museum. District 6 is an area of Cape Town that was bulldozed during apartheid because uh, white, colored, and black people lived there happily together. And the government said, that's not right, can't be doing with that, and just moved in, <laughs> flattened the place. Um, so that area is still a field in the center of Cape Town. Everyone was so horrified by that act. No one built on it, it's just, just so wrong. So what we did is we worked with the District 6 Museum and we started to build a virtual environment of District 6, how it looked in the 60s, from all the old stock photography. In fact, based on work done at Stanford about um, volumetric reconstruction from, from photographs. But I thought, how boring to sit in the museum. Mm. So what we did is we got cell phones, or actually we got PDAs, and we stuck GPS receivers on them and tilt sensors. And we built a time machine, right? So you can go out to the field, and this little window, the, the screen on the PDA, acts as a peephole back in time. And because you have GPS and tilt, you can see what was there at five frames per second. And it's not really kind of fully immersive yet. But you get the idea, OK? And it's kind of a nice technology for the future. And so just to finish off, um, I live in Africa. It's a nice place to come and visit. And if any of you are interested, um, I, you know, I'd be happy to chat to you about the projects. Um, we've got a conference coming up, uh, which is Designing Interactive Systems in Cape Town in February. So if any of you are into the, the design side more of interfaces and so on, we'd love your submissions. And if any of you know anyone, we'd love some sponsorship. Because our chief sponsor resigned from his company three days ago. And so we're now without a sponsor. And also, there's this really clever guy called Matt, who I wrote a book with. Um, if uh, I talk about a lot of uh, these projects in the last chapter, we wrote stuff on developing world. And so if you're interested in these kind of developing world aspects of mobile, um, that last chapter is probably a good place to start. There's lots of references and so on. And that is my 30 minutes up, I see. Excellent. Thank you. I'm keeping track of time, so if we can just start talking, and I'll cut it off. So you talk a lot about um, like Bluetooth and taking pictures with phones. Do people really have advanced handsets? I've seen a lot of just very basic Nokia. Ones. There's a lot of basic Nokia. Um, most of the ones do have Bluetooth. Okay. The camera phones are starting to come through now, and even the MP3 phones. Creative resource efficient solutions for the next in two years' time. Yeah. I mean, if you think of the cutting edge stuff that guys are doing, I mean, that's like you're thinking like five, six, seven years down the line for Africa. So you kind of got to work, work with the, the broad these events and hope that in a year or two's time, the simple <coughs> Bluetooth camera phones will kind of fall down to the market. And then we'll be ready with yeah, creative solutions for phase. that older technology. I met this one for a guy who had six MP3s on his phone. And he is doomed to listen to those six <laughs> MP3 for the rest of his life. There's no PC or internet. You said something in, in your Kai talk that was intriguing, I think intentionally provocative. And it was basically usability doesn't count. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say a little bit more about why that's for, for the people who weren't there? Because I think you made a very interesting argument for your particular design problem space. Yeah, and it was intended to be particularly provocative. So I, I said usability is irrelevant. Uh, and my rationale for saying that is that that's not the start of the process. You need to start with understanding what people actually need. If you can give them something they need or adds value to their life, they will figure out how to use it. Mm. And it's not like they have a lot of other distractions in your life. Well, that's not true. They don't have a lot of other technological distractions. They've only this one thing. They'll figure it out if it actually is useful. 
I mean, sure, they've got to go and carry water and all these things, but it's not like they're, oh, I don't have time to figure out the internet and the TV and the jolly handset, right? It just is a handset. And what, as soon as someone figures it out, there's such a community of use, you know, um, everyone will know how to do it. It's, it's amazing. It's, oh, look, you can do this and tell all their friends. And so the usability aspect is not that relevant unless you want to get published at Kai. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to follow up with that, I mean, watching people do mobile applications in the developed world, and people with commutes have more time to play around to find features. That does, it's a different thing. It's not that they're going to put up with things which aren't usable, but they will invest the time. So it's almost like it's fun to spend some time finding what this yeah. application will do. And I think you know we're trying to build things to promote that sort of engagement because it kind of locks them into the application a bit later on. So I think, again, we can learn from, yeah, it's a really nice thing to play learning from the um, emerging world into our world, which is also emerging you know, technologically. I was just wondering that. How do people choose their phones that they're buying or something like what are the criteria that you yeah. use or how the do they market phones? Different people. Um, there is this notion when I was talking to people that they want a strong handset. Now there's no English equivalent to what they actually mean. But by strong they mean it's got a good battery life. Okay. It's sufficiently thick, like Matt's razor here is too thin. And the people are like, mm, no, no. But if you have a brick phone, like a fifty one ten, you know those old Nokia's with the first express off ones? <gasps> people laugh at you. Terrible social faux pas. So there is, a, the, the most popular handset is the Nokia 1100 with the torch. Do you know this one? It's black and white screen. It's got a torch on the top. It's got a torch on the top. That is a useful feature if your village has no electricity. So I think I think one of the other things I picked up in my field work was it was really nice to be unique. So the nurses I worked with when, when the, the handset I gave them had a nice color screen. So that was a really important sort of status item, mm -hmm. you know, and it had a camera, you know, they can sort of archive their family photos and things like that. So, you know, to stand out and be unique was also quite an, quite an important thing. So that's an interesting point. Uh, before I ask a question, anybody else have a question? I do at some point. Sorry? Well, oh. I, I was actually wondering if uh, people get into photo sharing, like going into internet pictures and downloading pictures from their phones. Or is it too advanced? Uh, there is, there, well, in Cape Town they might, mm -hmm. but for the vast no, majority no. of Africa there are no internet There is no internet here. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so, can. So, so the big thing I found was when someone like the nurses had their, they would have fa very um, important family photos that they'd taken, like of their, their child that was back home or their, their sister who was working somewhere else, and they would sit you down once you'd met them and they would say, they would run you through this little presentation and they'd say this is my you know my daughter and this is my sister and this is my husband and that was quite an important thing that you went through that that motion with them. yeah and as opposed to just like downloading it on computers so it's actually a lot more personal yeah i mean you've got it with you the whole time mm -hmm. and when you meet people you know out comes the phone and mm -hmm. you go for the family stories